In this session of the Purple Coffee Podcast, I speak to Evo Terra about the hardships in taking a job when your gut says no. <laughs> Hello and welcome and thank you for joining me today for session 43 of the Purple Coffee Podcast, inspiring entrepreneur stories from the world's most awesome. I am your host, Turndog, and on this occasion I speak to Evo Terra, who's been in the podcasting game for a long time. He's the main man behind Podio Books, among a lot of other ventures along the way. He's got his hands in quite a few fires and he's a cool cat indeed. And I'm lucky enough to have shown Evo around my local area of Yorkshire and he shared some more of his wisdom in personal form, which was very cool and indeed. But on this occasion, he shares a few of his most important lessons that he's learned along the time, as well as how he sees mistakes and including his big mistake, which centered around taking a job for the wrong reasons. Even when his gut said, don't do this either, walk the other way, he decided to go in and give it a shot, which let's face it, is admirable and something the majority of entrepreneurs do in fact do, because without opportunity, what are we? But his gut was saying, no, this isn't a good idea. He did it anyway because of, well, the money because of the opportunity all these things but it ended up taking him down a bad route but it taught him a great deal about what projects to dive into and to ultimately give his gut more time to make a sensible and educated decision which is ultimately what it's all about so I'm really excited to share this with you it's a great conversation there's lots of nuggets to be taken from this so be sure to get out your pen and notepad and make some notes but before we jump into the most awesome convo with Mr. Terra then I'm going to share his bio with you which is something I often like to do so let's just do that right now and waste no more time <clears throat> Evo Terra has the kind of name you don't forget I remember reading it and thinking, I bet he's an interesting guy. Let's chat with him. I then realized I was speaking to myself, so I decided I'd email him instead and quit toying on the line of crazy. Hmm. And I'm so glad I did because he's a dude with lots of ventures, both past and present, and a rather crazy love for craft beer and sausage. You may immediately assume he's a hipster, but if he is, then he's one of their founder members. Mm hmm. With a pedigree in podcasting going back to the beginning and hand in publishing and more, he's a man with an ever-changing plan but a unique outlook on the world. To say he's an interesting fellow is quite the understatement, but as interesting as his name, hmm, maybe not quite. It's an awesome name after all. So here's myself and Mr. Evo Terror, chatting shop and such. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me, and I'm delighted this evening to be joined, although it's 12 o'clock where he is, by Evo Terra, who is president of Podio Books, which is kind of like a podcast com book, audio book world. It's really cool. I encourage you to check that out. And is also involved in Big Bounce and Scribble, and is a bit of a master podcaster, written some books ranging from craft beer to podcasting for dummies. So... A bit of a jack of all trades, Evo. First of all, thank you for joining me. A pleasure, kind sir. Thanks for inviting me on the program, Matthew. I'm happy to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure all mine. Well, rather than me trying to mess up your intro, I'm just going to pass it over to you so you can explain who you are, what it is that you do, and yeah, introduce us all into your lovely little world. Sure. I will I will try and keep it brief because I could, I could talk about me forever, but I don't <laughs> want to do that. And that's not just because I like talking about me. It's because I've, I've done a lot of things. So we'll we'll key in on the things that, that, that you mentioned out there, and I'll expand on those a, a little longer. Um, so, yes, I am, I'm president of a company called Podiobooks.com. We blend podcasting and audiobooks. Podcasting plus audiobooks equals Podiobooks. Simple enough. About 700 titles, almost, exactly 679 as of this recording, but I, I add a book or two each month typically. Uh, those are available for free. Anybody can go download the book, subscribe to the RSS feed, and get all of the individual episodes of, of any given book. won't cost you a dime. been doing that for nine years now. Nine years is a long, long time, uh, and, and it's been a lot of fun helping authors 
utilize uh, their existing work and in, in, in the novelty of podcasting to hopefully grow their audience uh, so that people will go buy their stuff. It's not just let's give it away for free because free is fun. Let's give it away for free because free is an excellent marketing vehicle for, for many authors to use. So that's patiobooks.com. Um, old, long-time podcaster. I started podcasting on October the 14th, 2004. So it has been almost 10 years that I have been in the podcast world. Well, crazy. Wrote Podcasting for Dummies or co-authored it with my, my partners, obviously. Um, lots of other books. You mentioned, um, um, I believe you mentioned a book about the beer diet. I do that every every October. That's a, that's a lot of fun. Uh, beer and sausage is my sole source of calories for the entire month of October and I don't die believe it or not so it's kind well, of I, I mean the Germans do it so you know yeah that, yeah they do it doesn't uh, kill them all <laughs> not, not, not yet you know <laughs> they, uh, they, they've kind of done that and um, and then finally uh, I, I run a, a company in Tempe Arizona where I live called Big Bounce our job is to help disruptive startups figure out how to become a real company so yes. that's all of me or some of me in a nutshell I mean, it is a little bit of everything. And I, I must say, I love audio books. The whole idea of, I, I like serialized fiction. I think it makes sense in this modern world where you can just be given weekly doses of something new. You can spread an entire novel out over a space of a year and to do it in audio, that's just kind of fantastic. And I, lo and I know that you kind of work on a tip type basis at audio books too. So there's always kind of a bit of a, an in for people to share some love with their authors in the site. So I think it's a great site. You're doing a great thing. Very cool indeed. Thank you very much. So yeah, a little bit of everything though. I mean, working from podcasts to books and you know, helping startups. You are a man who's tried a little bit of everything over the years. So I've got to say, I'm quite interested to hear what your mistakes slash mistakes are going to be. And for <laughs> those regular listeners and viewers, we'll know this is an aid of the success mistake, a book all about an entrepreneur's great mistake and how they turned it around so good folk like yourself can learn from them. And I also hope along the way that we learn to love mistakes and embrace them because they tend to be rather cool indeed and a catalyst to great things. So I'm just going to pass it over to you, Evo, and I hope you will share a story with us. Tell us how it all began, how it played out, and the journey it's taken you on since. Take it from yeah. there. Right. Um, you know, it's it's funny. I've I've been involved w with publishing as as a portion of what I do, not not just as an author, but obviously facilitating people's works through patiobooks.com. I used to have a, a radio show before podcasting, and we were focused on on interviewing authors. And one of the things that independent authors specifically or, or newly minted authors do as kind of a badge of honor is they they keep all of their rejection letters that is a, a typical thing that authors will do if you go to any um, struggling author or recently successful author or, or as I like to call um, the ones I like to work with the underpublished authors that are out there many of them have just stacks and stacks of rejection letters um, and so that to me kind of gets into the idea of the of the great mistake. You know, that's it, a reminder that they're trying and doing stuff. I've always had a problem with that because when you're an author, when you've written a book that's getting rejected, um, it gets rejected for a for a couple of different reasons. And the, and the primary reason a book gets rejected is not because there are people that are gatekeepers that won't let you in their their world. Um, it's because the book isn't very good. Or it needs some polish. It needs some help on that, right? But rejection letters don't tell you that. They don't actually allow you to get better. If that first book that you put out there was a mistake, and oftentimes it actually is, there's no getting better from that one. Um, so when I entered the world of entrepreneurship a few years back, you get immediate feedback when you've made a bad idea. When, when you try to put something forward, nobody will pay you for it, typically is what happens. And you can learn from that. You can quickly pivot. Uh, you can change your technique and, and do something better and, and, and grow from that. Authors haven't yet figured out a way to do that, and I, and I think that's, that's terrible. Um, so, so hopefully, with the advent new things that are happening in publishing these days, that more authors will be quicker to adapt. Maybe they won't completely and totally finish the book and get it polished up and put it out in the marketplace before they've had some testing on it. There's a company called leanpub.org that's helping that right now. I love the guys behind Lean taking that methodology. So anyhow, there's a little appeal to me. Since we were talking about books before, I wanted to talk about books and a mistake and maybe the authors get it. Um, as far as mine, my specific mistake, um, 
it's it's interesting to think about that because I've got a litany of them, right? I mean, every every scene, little day, I do something that's kind of incorrect and wrong. And but and a lot of those things, I wouldn't change them for the world, because every single mistake that I've made, that I've experienced, has has taught me something about that. It's when you forget to when you forget those lessons that's bad. But if I had to pick one from the entrepreneurship world, um, several years ago I, I had a client. Actually I had two clients. I was doing independent work for the first time in, in a very long time. I, I typically keep a day job to pay me so that I can afford to do these fun, interesting hobby things like give away hundreds of books for free. Um, I, had, I was doing independent work, working with a client and who had a lot of money and was paying me a nice healthy wage and really wanted me to go into business with him uh, in this startup. And I knew that the startup was doomed. It just smelled like it from the beginning. But I was a consultant, he was paying me and he was taking my advice and so it, it was fine. Uh, he asked me to join the startup about six months into it. And even though that I knew it was doomed to fail, I looked at that guy and, and my, my sole criteria for taking the job was that he's got a very expensive lifestyle and he has lots of mouths to feed. This is where he's putting all of his attention. He's not a guy like me who does eight projects at a time. This guy does one thing and he has to make this thing work out. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I just don't see the reality um, that's happening here. So I'm going to hitch my wagon with this guy and we're going to do it. Yeah, three months later we were completely and totally out of money uh, and, and I'm out of a job. Something that was supposed to last for a year only lasted three months because he blew all the money like like crazy. Uh, turns out I probably should have trusted my instincts and ran as far away as possible when he did that. Um, but I didn't. But boy, since that time, yeah, trust the instincts. If I know something is not, not helpful, I just stay away from it and look for the next opportunity. There's always another opportunity down the road. Oh, absolutely. There's always going to be opportunities to bring in. And I, I think it's such a valid point about you bring, you know, listening to your gut because we all say that, oh yeah, that's the obvious thing. I always listen to my gut, but how often do we, you know, we get blinded by the, you know, the sunlight. It's like, well, ooh, there's a bit of money being shown. I, I, this doesn't seem like a good client. I know this isn't a client. I kind of know something's going to go wrong, but he's giving me a nice big hefty paycheck or she's giving me all these promises and, you know, mm -hmm. this job could lead to, you know, the upper heavens. And deep down you kind of think, but I don't quite trust it. Yet we still get in bed with them. Why? It's crazy. Yeah, I, I, I think it's because we as a species, as individual people, we're looking for the next big thing. We look for that one thing that's going to put us to the next, the next spot, right? And there's a psychology studies that show that you know, we, we have this internal monologue that tells ourselves all the time that today I'm finally where I'm supposed to be. It just kind of happens all, all the time. And it doesn't matter if you're 18 years old or you're 64 years old. You just feel like this is the moment. It probably tapers off towards the end. But, you know, when you're in your productive years, this is this is it for me. And so you get these opportunities that, that come up there. And it's an interesting novel. It's like, wow, I thought that's where I was. But this allows me to go one step further, and so they're very, they're very tantalizing. You, you have to, you feel like you have to jump on those um, when, when they're when they're around. The interesting thing, though, is I, I like to do what I call increase my luck surface area. I don't know if you've heard that terminology before, but it's about making myself available for luck because I don't really believe in luck. Like I don't go to the store and buy lottery tickets because I know math. And I know that that's not a good a good bet, but I'm lucky in the sense that I let myself be exposed to lots of different things and opportunities that come, so I can pick up on them quickly and jump in with something. But trusting your gut is a big part of that. I I'm exposed daily to new opportunities and ideas, and I I don't have the scale to explore all of them. So what I do instead is I I dabble here and there, and I look for the ones that that smell a little bit promising and follow them down the road. But I've learned to not jump head first into something that I that just seems like a bad idea. Yeah, because some people will assume that, oh, well, if he's not going to listen to his gut, he's just going to say no to everything. This is a guy who just says no to opportunity. And being an entrepreneur, you've always got to be mindful to opportunity. You've always got to keep your eye out because it's ultimately these opportunities that help us go from A to B to C, etc. But mm -hmm. 
you know, you need to be listening to your gut because not all opportunities are good opportunities and you should say no every now and again, be it a client or a project or a new venture. Right. There's nothing wrong with saying no. There's nothing wrong with saying yes. You, you've got to find the happy medium. And I don't think it's, I think it's a false dichotomy between yes and no. And somebody wants me to get involved with the project. I, I just left an, an, an outstanding event here in town where I probably met a dozen people and I want to work with every single one of them, but to varying degrees. For many of them, I'm just going to act as an, as an, an advisor for them. So when they are faced with a crossroads, what should I do? They can contact me and I can, you know, within five or 10 minutes, give them my opinion of of what they ought to do, and that's and that's pretty valuable advice. Others will probably develop much more of a professional relationship. We're working together, uh, and some, uh, you know, I haven't figured out how we're going to work with them. They seem cool and interesting. I just need to figure out what that is, and that's listening to your gut as well. Hmm. So, what's kind of a process that goes through your mind now? You've been burnt from it. You had a job. You thought it was going to last a year, and it lasted three months. You disobeyed your gut, even though you knew you shouldn't do. So now when you come across an opportunity, are you, are you kind of having this in a monologue of, hmm, is this a good person? Is it a bad person? Because I'm guessing it's not just when you meet people, but, you know, new ventures, when you actually come across a new client, you've always got an opportunity to kind of say yes or no, or, you know, find that happy medium. Like, what goes through your mind these days? Um, it's it's a multi-part process, and I, and I wish it was really tight and organized, but that's not how the meat works inside of my head. It's it's pretty messy up inside of there. But I do have a couple of things that I look for. You know, obviously the first thing is a personality match. Can I work with this person? If we suddenly become either partners or a client service relationship going on, is it going to be good for me? Would I like them? Uh, would I want to work with them ongoing? And of course, you really don't know until you start with people. But I typically don't have my initial conversations all about, here's why I want to work with you. I, I try and get to know them as a person. Do, do our values match? If the values match, awesome. Then the next thing is to look at it is, what do I think the length of the opportunity is? And in some cases, I'm not looking for a long opportunity. Opportunity. Sometimes I say, you know, I, I need something for the next three weeks or so that's going to be interesting and I want to get rid of it. Although there are some things that I want to be involved with for, for years to come. Um, so that all depends. And so I, I try and engage that to make sure it, it, that they're going to be around as long as I want to be around uh, and, and working for them. And, and then an, another layer that I put in there is, let's say, and this is probably my best piece of advice, let's say I pass on this opportunity. I'm not going to invest in it. I'm not going to spend some time in it. Um, even if I was to pass on it, is the product or service something that I would like to see in the marketplace? Um, and if that's a yes, then that will sometimes override the other two. Sometimes I'll say, well, the person's kind of a jerk, but man, this is a product that needs to get in there. I, I think I can help in a way. Or, you know, this is probably an eight year long project. I'm, I only want to work on it for six months. But if it's a product that to me has value, if it's in the marketplace, and it could be a product, service, whatever out there, um, that, that's really key to me. But if the answer to that question is no, even if the person is awesome. This person is great. Um, I think this opportunity is perfect. But, you know, if I was not personally invested in this thing, I don't really care if it exists, then I'm out because there's there's no point. There's lots of interesting opportunities that for somebody else might make sense. But if to me it's not helping make the world a place I want to live in in the future, then I'm, I'm probably going to pass. Interesting, interesting. I suppose if all three align, then it's the kind of thing where you're happy to jump in two legs, you know, head first, happy, happy, happy. But if one of them isn't, that's when you start thinking, oh, well, I'll be involved, but I want to, you know, just tiptoe it. I want to make sure that I'm not kind of investing it per se, but I'll help out. I'll have a few coffees. I'll, you know, I'll see where this takes me for a little while and, you know, we'll let my gut, you know, play with this yeah. for a few more weeks. Is that the case? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. I will continue to talk, and we'll find out. And at some point, if my if my suspicions are, you know, either if they're heightened up, like this is just not a good idea, then I don't want to waste anybody else's time. I'm I'm good about telling the person that this, I don't think that I'm a fit. And if they ask for criticism on, you know, what it is about it that didn't work, I'm I'm, I'm happy to give them. But I I, I try to make it about me more than I make it about them. But the other is true. I and mean, if we've sat for two or three coffees, and I and I recognize that maybe I made a snap judgment. Early uh, on this person, and they actually do know what the hell they're talking about, and I think I can make a jump. Then, then, then I'll jump in. But it's also not a jump in all the way, or you know, that, that's that's not a, what I have to do. In many cases, it's I like I said before, I just want to be an advisor on the project for a while. So feel free to email me anytime you want, and I'll give you a response. Sometimes after a few weeks of doing that, I I see an opportunity to do something more, and I'll I'll reach out and say let's let's formalize this a little bit tighter.
Is it just a case more often than not to give your gut a little bit more time to actually create a valued opinion? Because sometimes, you know, we, we have these snap judgments and we listen to our gut on this chance meeting. We come across someone at a networking event and, you know, we listen to our gut in these situations. More often than not, your gut is right. But, you know, if you're able to give these instincts a few weeks to mature and to kind of just make a bit more of a, I guess, educated guess rather than Certainly. a judgment. Yeah, yeah, th that's exactly what it is. I mean, the, the, we, we talk about this thing as the gut, and the latent scientists in me t wants to remind everybody that there is no brain inside of your gut. It really doesn't do a good job of thinking. It's good. We, it's, it's a metaphor for us making snap decisions. But the rest of it, I want, I want this thing to work on it and, and noodle the process some more. So rather than make a snap decision of, no, I'm not going to work on that, or yes, I'm jumping with both feet, I, I want a little bit of time to actually let the piece of meat that's good at thinking about things run through uh, the process. The other challenge is, especially at networking events, which I abhor networking events, they're just soul-sucking in many, many times. Someone's put on a face for you. They're, they're, this is the one thing they want to talk about. Um, so you're not getting the full picture of who that person is. So if you find someone at a networking event that you think is, is a good connection, follow up. Have emails. Go have a pint somewhere together. Uh, just see if whether or not what's what's the other aspect of this person. Don't just keep talking about that one thing they talked about at the networking event. Find out if is that a person that you want to stay involved with for any length of time, and that and that just takes getting to know someone. Mm. Because I, I totally agree with that. I mean, if you've got a gut instinct and you let this thing or you know your heart, as it sometimes is, you know, just run run forward without any care. For what your gut is saying, that's dangerous. But mm -hmm. if only you listen to your gut and you don't let this thing play a part at all, then, like you say, if there's no brain in your gut, you're just going to be making these pointless decisions every day. And you're like, what the hell am I doing? I'm not letting yeah, you know, no. the thing that's my most valued part of my body make any input whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. You know, you don't wake up in the morning and, you know, flip over a card to find out if you should get dressed or not. You know, you don't flip a coin at the intersection to say, should I turn right? Should I turn left? You know where the hell you're going, yeah. right? I mean, you, you should just go ahead and do that. There are some decisions that need to be given lots and lots of thoughts uh, to before you make a decision on it, no doubt. Yeah. And I think it is a case of finding a balance. And I like your idea of, you know, what's the person like? What's the time frame like? And what's the product like? And if these things align, then yes, great. If not, Give my gut, give my brain a little bit more time to think things through. I think that's a very good, good approach. From an entrepreneurial point of view, I'm sure there's plenty of people watching and listening, thinking, "Well, God, this can come in so many ways." I, I feel, from a startup point of view, especially when money's tight, you get these clients coming at you all the time. You know, you, you, it might not be a good fit, but at the same time, you find it difficult to say no because you need the money. What's your kind of thought then? You've started a new project, you've opened up this new venture. You know a client's not a great fit, but the money's pretty good. What do you do in that situation? You really have one of two options. Um, if if cash flow is tight, if you've in, in, to speak in entrepreneur and startup language, moment, if you're out of your runway, if the runway is quickly approaching, then there's no shame in doing just about anything to to keep the lights on uh, and and bring income in. So I, I it, so if you've got plenty of runway, you can pass on those opportunities. But when you're approaching the end, when your bank accounts are you know approaching zero on this one, then then do what you need. The trick is to figure out a way to still allow yourself the time to continue to build your startup and, and prove out your MVPs and do all the customer development, all the all the things you have to do in running a successful startup. Even even when it's not working, you still have to do those things. You have to somehow compartmentalize your, your time to, to do it both ways. So if you can avoid taking a full-time job, great, because full-time jobs typically take yeah, full-time, you know, 40 hours or so a week, sometimes 50 or 60 to get it. That only leaves nights and weekends, and, and sometimes you, you definitely have to do that. Um, when you have to do that, I like to go into the companies that I'm working for and, and set the expectation up front. I, five years ago when I jumped back into the in the advertising world, um, I, I I was very upfront and honest, and I and I told the people that I was there for that I would jump in and help them. Everything seemed to be fine, but I would give them six months. Well, that turned into five years, but nonetheless, at least I had given them the, op the idea upfront that I'm going to I'm going to leave here, and they were very smart about that. They liked me, and so they just kept changing my job all the time. So I was doing something new, and so it was more like instead of a five year plan, it was really um, ten six months. Yeah, stints, no, you so did split. you did six months just <laughs> exactly. over and over again, over and yeah. over again, right? That's that's kind of one of the, the 
one of the things I've done with my career, I've been pretty successful about quitting companies and then having them hire me back on as a consultant. Just nice. awesome. I don't intentionally do it, but it, but it's happened <laughs> four times now. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, so you can do that, or if you decide you want to take some some clients and not get a full time job, make sure you're not setting up anything super long term. You know, I I will help you on this project for the next three months, or I can dedicate this number of hours to you. Just be very clear and honest about about what your availability is, uh, and don't feel too bad about doing the things that you have to do to make money. You might find an interesting way to parlay that into additional service offerings for your entrepreneurship as well. I think what I'm sort of taking for all this is, you know, just be conscious of the fact that you need to have this balance between, you know, listening to your gut, giving yourself enough time to think. And even if you are, you know, like you say, if you're down and out and you just need to take money, there's no shame in taking it. Even if you know the client's not a good fit, you do what you have right. to do. But if you can get into a um, situation where you've constantly thinking, and you're constantly conscious of like, right going through this process of, you know, what's the person like, what's the situation like, what's the product like. Then when it comes to hiring your first people, you know, you're going to go through that again. You do these interviews, you have to make these judgments and these gut judgments of, is this person right for my business? If you've got these alarm clocks going off your head, they're there for a reason. You know, mm -hmm. when new people throw opportunities and new ventures at you, the same thing. There's always going to be these things coming at you in different stages of your entrepreneurial journey. And if you're open and conscious to this idea of I've got to listen to my gut, but only to a certain degree, it'll probably lead you down good avenues. Exactly right. Exactly right. Fantastic. So, I mean, I think it's a great story. I love your mistake. And I also love the mistake from the um, writer situation as well, where, where you started this from. Um, as a writer myself, it is very difficult. You start a story and you kind of go full in. And you never know whether it's going to be right or not. So, yes, it'll be interesting to see if we are able to adapt like um, software and manufacturing companies have in the last 10 years. It will be interesting indeed. And I know the Lean Publishing company you mean, and they're doing some pretty cool things. And I feel crowdfunding as well is mm -hmm. um, helping that situation a lot. So just to finish things off, if you could leave a bit of um, one chunk of advice that we've not discussed yet to someone who's maybe in that decision, you know, they've met someone recently. They're a bit torn between them, you know, whether it's a new client or a new business partner. Something's kind of telling them it's not the right fit, but it's at the same time a good opportunity. You know, what what would you sort of say to this person? Well, we've we've talked a lot about listening to ourselves, whatever. What, what we didn't talk about is uh, listening to other people. You know, sometimes your first impression with someone is is terribly wrong, and first impressions are almost impossible to get past. I mean, if I, if I meet somebody on the street and I, I make a snap decision about them, uh, even if I find out later, if another friend of mine says, no, no, I've talked to that guy and he's, you know, he rescues kittens four hours a day, you know, and, and it's still tough for me to, to get out of that model. It's just the way that our brain works. Um, well, we, we now have this thing called the internet and chances are the people that you meet likely have an online fingerprint or in my case is more of online body parts. I mean, they're just strewn. It's like a DNA wasteland out there. Um, so find out about the person. Don't, don't, don't always assume your first impressions were right. Figure out and you know, do a little search. Follow them on LinkedIn. See if they've got a Facebook profile, all of those things, and, and just understand that. And seek, see if you have friends of friends and find out, you know, hey, I met this guy. Don't tell your friend what you think. Say, I met this guy. Um, can, what can you tell me about him? I see that you're connected. Tell me, tell me what you think. I mean, it's almost like if you were checking references yeah. for someone if you were running a job. There's, there's no reason to do that with either the person that you meet, or in some cases, even the opportunity. You can, you can research a lot of information online. I mean, if you're an entrepreneur and you're not using things like Crunchbase and AngelList um, and and companies like that, to, or services like that, to figure out if these opportunities are good or not outside of your own impression, you're, you're kind of missing the boat. There's a lot of data out. There there uh explore it find out if you're if you're right or wrong mm, it's like i mean our minds are pretty crazy thing and sometimes <sighs> it'll make these judgments with no rational <laughs> anything whatsoever you're just like i don't like this guy because he was wearing weird shoes and i didn't like him therefore i hate him and and here's the funny thing about that he might not have been wearing those shoes one thing that neuroscience proves to us again and again and again is our brains lie to us all the time i know this thing happened in my past no Nope. You don't know a damn thing. Reality, I mean, we've, we've done it several tests to show that, yeah, in red shoes, pff, 
he had a red coat on. He was actually wearing blue shoes. You know, I mean, that, that kind of stuff. And people, that's not the way my brain yeah. works. I've seen it happen. So recognize that this thing, while for as interesting and as wonderful of a machine as it, it is flawed like you wouldn't believe. So <laughs> don't assume that it's, it's telling you the truth. Go use some independent validation sources. Mine in particular feels very flawed on most days. So I can <laughs> well, that. Yeah, here's the deal. Uh, don't, and I'm, I don't make any decisions in the month of October because well, that's when I'm drinking beer and eating sausage. And uh, right. low-grade buzz and a low-grade hunger all day long does not make for the best decision-making. No, I feel like people will be coming to you for you know money advice on those ones. Like, you owe me like 100 right? But, yeah, sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that'll be that'll be a good time. Luckily, my wife does not go through the diet with me, so uh, she keeps tabs on things. I don't know it's that person good, at the time. It's a good idea. Good idea. <laughs> well, I love it. I um, I've loved your your journey and your advice. I, I think it's a fantastic process to go through. Of you know, questioning what's this person like. You know, how long is it going to take? What's the situation? What's the product? Do these things have to align? You know, involve other people. But what I take from everything is, you know, just give yourself some time. Yes, listen to your gut, but put yourself in a position where you can mull over it. Unless you're in October, in which case, just don't listen to anything. Have another pint and do it. Why not? Yeah, it's a good time. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Eva. It's been a great conversation. I've absolutely loved it. It's been a great journey. And um, both from your outlook for the future offers, I know some offers will be watching and listening to this. They'll probably go, yeah, how have we not figured that out soon? So thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Matthew. Appreciate it. Cheers. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining me for today's session of the Purple Coffee Podcast. And a big thank you to Evo Terra for sharing his most awesome mistake and what a grand one it was indeed. It's something that I can relate to a great deal and I'm sure you can too. After all, as an entrepreneur and a self-made man, and woman, what are we without opportunity? And more often than not, we need to say yes in order to let that opportunity into our life. But there's a big difference between saying yes because something inside us lights up and it lights a fire within us and we're excited, and to say yes because of the money and because it's a job. On this occasion, I think Evo did the latter and it took him down a rather poor route. His insides were saying, no, don't do this. It's not going to be worth your while. But it's taught him a great deal about future projects and when to say yes and no. And it's something we all must get used to. After all, who are we without opportunity? It comes across us each and every day and we never know what it will include and when. So you need to know when to say yes and you need to say no, when to say no. And more important, you need to know when to take a step back and allow your inner gut feeling to marinate and to make a more educated decision and such. So I hope you've taken a lot from this. I know it's a chat that I have taken a great deal from and I love to share it. So thank you for joining me. And if you wanna learn more about Evo and his ever changing world, you can mosey on over to tdog.co forward slash purple coffee 43. That's tdog.co forward slash purple coffee 43. The show notes are there as well as links to Evo's world. And if you have a chance, be sure to leave a review and rating and to subscribe via iTunes and all that jazz. It helps out a podcast like myself oh so much. So please do that if you find a few seconds. But otherwise, have a most awesome day. It's been a pleasure having you. And I can't wait to see you next time around here on the Purple Coffee Podcast. So virtual high five across the airwaves and such. Have a great one and cheers.